Secretary General, welcome to In Conversation. It is an enormous pleasure to be with you again. It's been a year almost to a day since that shocking military coup in Myanmar. And since then, things have only degenerated. Civilians have been killed on the streets, activists are being imprisoned, and the refugee situation has got even worse. Has the international community abandoned Myanmar? I don't think the international community abandoned Myanmar. On the contrary, uh, we are totally committed to support the Myanmarese people. And uh, uh, we have been clear that we want democracy to be reestablished. We want prisoners to be released. And we want the end of repression to the people in the streets, especially with the, the number of victims that is appalling uh, that uh, uh, has been occurring in, in recent times. Uh, I've been in very close contact with ASEAN. Um, I uh, am a strong supporter of the five points that were decided by the ASEAN leaders. And uh, um, uh, I also welcome the fact that uh, the ASEAN leaders uh, have not received uh, uh, the de facto leader of uh, uh, Myanmar in the summit that they had, as well as I did not participate uh, uh, and we did not have a meeting uh, uh, of the uh, uh, UN ASEAN uh, at the level of Ministers of Foreign Affairs. So I think there has been a very clear position that we want things to change in Myanmar. Uh, of course, we know that the Security Council is divided on this issue, and so the capacity of the Security Council to act is limited, but I have not lost hope, and I want to express to the people of Myanmar my total solidarity in this tragic situation in which uh, the political problems are uh, compounded by COVID, uh, by terrible humanitarian suffering uh, for a people that uh, doesn't deserve it. I've been in Myanmar several times in my past capacity as High Commissioner for Refugees, and uh, uh, the people of Myanmar does not deserve to be treated in this way. Should ASEAN continue to block Myanmar's military chief from attending meetings? I believe that the five points that ASEAN have put on the table should be accepted by the uh, de facto authorities of Myanmar. And uh, if uh, that is not the case, as it is not the case, I, I don't see the, the legitimacy of uh, uh, having such a meeting. Is Aung San Suu Kyi indispensable to the peace process? I think so. Look, uh, uh, I was sometimes very uh, angry with Aung San Suu Kyi when she was in power, namely because of the Rohingya refugees. And uh, the truth is that Aung San Suu Kyi, that had an enormous reputation internationally as a democratic leader and uh, someone that fought for democracy for many years uh, in jail and in very difficult circumstances, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, has lost largely that reputation, has uh, uh, lost uh, the international uh, admiration and support exactly by siding with the military and supporting the military, even going to a trial to uh, defend the military. If any criticism Aung San Suu Kyi would, des would, would uh, um, deserve is to be supportive of the military. So this uh, uh, attitude of the military in relation to Aung San Suu Kyi is not only politically uh, a disaster, but it's also morally uh, unacceptable. You've just appointed a new envoy to Myanmar. What do you want her to achieve? Exactly uh, to create the conditions uh, in close cooperation of ASEAN to allow us to go out of this vicious circle. At a certain moment, we need to have a serious dialogue with all parties that are relevant. Uh, and for, for that, of course, uh, uh, some of them that are in jail must be released. 
and uh, uh, we need to have a dialogue that is meaningful and not uh, a dialogue that is just a, a, a disguised way uh, for uh, the, the military to legitimize themselves. China is Myanmar's very, very big neighbor. It is the absolute most dominant economic trading partner and contact. Should China be doing more to stop the violence in Myanmar? We have been uh, in dialogue with uh, China on this. Uh, China has promoted a number of initiatives, uh, namely in the dialogue between Myanmar and uh, Bangladesh. But of course, uh, uh, I mean, it would be very important that all key uh, countries that have uh, a relationship with Myanmar intensify their efforts. So my appeal to China, my appeal to ASEAN, my appeal to uh, Europe, my appeal to the US, my appeal to Russia, my appeal to all of them, is to unite as much as possible and to do everything uh, necessary for the situation to get out of this vicious circle that is so dramatic for the people of Myanmar. It's not only Myanmar. We are witnessing in the world now a new fashion, military coup d'etats. Um, and this is unacceptable. Uh, this reminds us of the 60s. This reminds us of other periods in history. But we thought that those periods were ended. Uh, it's absolutely essential that uh, uh, armies around the world respect civilian governments, especially democratic governments, and uh, uh, it is essential that uh, uh, um, situations uh, like the ones in Myanmar uh, or like the ones that have happened in several African countries uh, allow for uh, the return uh, to uh, the democracies or the democratic processes. Myanmar was not yet a real democracy, but it was progressing in a democratic process, uh, uh, and we need to go back uh, to that progress. Secretary General, you have already said that you plan to attend the opening ceremony of the Beijing Winter Olympics. Why? Because uh, I believe uh, the Olympic Games uh, represent uh, uh, a very strong message of peace. The Olympics represent a fantastic message to the world, a message of peace, a message of mutual respect between people of all cultures, all civilizations, all ethnicities. And this is absolutely essential in the moment we already see the multiplication of xenophobia, the multiplication of uh, racism, uh, when we see white supremacy, uh, 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 when uh, we see how migrants and refugees uh, uh, are sometimes treated in an absolutely unacceptable way. So it is necessary to value the spirit of the Olympics, which is a spirit that uh, is very much linked to the values of the UN. Peace, mutual understanding, uh, not only tolerance, respect, mutual respect and uh, dialogue between all cultures, all civilizations, all religions, and they will all be uh, uh, in the Olympics. So this Olympic spirit uh, is something that we need to value at the present moment. And I think it should be not linked to any political objective. Does this mean that the US is actually exacerbating global tensions by its decision to do a diplomatic boycott? Was that necessary? I think countries have the right to do what uh, countries uh, consider uh, that is adequate in relation to their own appreciation of the situation. Uh, my position is, uh, I uh, am Secretary General of the UN, so I represent all countries of the world. The Olympic, uh, uh, the International Olympic Committee is a close partner to the UN. 
uh, I was invited by the International Olympic Committee and of course with the invitation also of the uh, host country. So uh, uh, I thought uh, uh, it was my duty uh, to be there. Uh, of course, uh, countries uh, assume their own policies according to their own uh, strategies uh, uh, and it is not for me to comment on whatever uh, different countries do. At the core of all of this, Secretary General, isn't it really the US-China deteriorating relationship? Isn't that really what underlies all of this? But that is a very worrying thing. Uh, uh, it is absolutely essential that uh, those countries that have more power uh, uh, are able to cooperate, even if there are differences. And I've been saying many times, it's clear the US and China have very different positions and it's natural that uh, uh, they have confronted situations uh, when we speak about human rights or when we speak about uh, some uh, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, problems uh, uh, in the region. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is an area where I believe there is a common convergent interest, which is climate. And there is an area where I believe it's necessary a serious negotiation because there are differences, but there is also the reality of a globalized world. And that is uh, uh, all things that relate to trade and technology. And I would strongly encourage the United States and China to seriously negotiate, put on the table together with other partners that are relevant in the world, those questions of trade and technology. Of course, politically, the systems are different. Politically, the cultures are different. It's normal that there is a confrontation in many aspects, but that should not, uh, uh, that should not put into question the areas of cooperation that are needed, and that should not put into question uh, the uh, absolute uh, need for people to put on the table the differences and try to solve them as far as possible. Uh, when we look into the trade and technology in today's world, where the risk of uh, a decoupling, the risk of having uh, two regions in the world uh, with two different uh, sets of economic rules, two dominated, uh, dominating currencies, two different internets, uh, this, this kind of separation uh, would be, in my opinion, extremely negative, especially for the developing countries. What can the rest of us do while these two big countries slug it out? What can we do? I think that uh, we can do is uh, uh, talk to both of them and express to both of them that uh, we fully respect their differences, but we believe that beyond those differences, there are areas of cooperation that need to be intensified and there are areas of negotiation that to be done uh, in an effective way putting everything on the table, not disguising uh, realities, putting everything on the table, but uh, addressing uh, the, the problems that exist, the different concepts that exist in relation to crucial areas. And if one looks at uh, today, we, have in a we live in a digital world. And uh, it is important uh, that uh, the digital world uh, is regulated. We see so many abuses in the digital world, so many risks in the digital world, and that requires cooperation of all countries. You've talked a lot about vaccine inequality. You've said that nobody is safe until we all are safe. So who needs to do more? I think it's clearly that uh, the countries that produce vaccines uh, or uh, the companies that produce vaccines uh, need to be able to come together and uh, not only uh, to uh, ensure a fair distribution of those vaccines, but also to create the conditions for other countries that have the capacity to do so, to produce also vaccines. Uh, we have a complex uh, regime. Uh, there was a proposal to um, allow for licenses uh, to be available for intellectual property 
uh, to be, uh, I would say, suspended. But it's necessary more than that. I think it's necessary to look into all countries that can produce vaccines and those that produce them with the companies that produce them to make uh, the necessary arrangements and the, eventually to pay the compensations that would be necessary to the private sector in order to guarantee that we have the possibility to produce vaccines in many more countries uh, because we have a clear objective that was put on the table by the uh, World Health Organization to vaccinate 70% of the population in every country by June. And there was a previous target to vaccinate 40% of every country in December. We are far from uh, that. There are a large number of countries. The Africa situation is absolutely immoral. I mean, it's immoral to see the African people with so little vaccines, uh, the overwhelming majority without the first dose, when three doses are becoming common uh, in different parts of the developed world. So why isn't it happening, Secretary General? Why aren't the rich countries, because largely a lot of production still takes place there, why isn't it, why aren't we doing more? Why aren't developed countries doing more? Because uh, uh, solidarity is part of human nature, but egoism is also part of human nature. And we have seen egoism predominating over uh, solidarity in this regard. Uh, and uh, it is obvious for me that, uh, uh, of course, developed countries have the, the right uh, uh, to protect their own populations, but uh, uh, there are ways in which this could be done in a compatible uh, situation, uh, allowing for uh, vaccines to spread like wildfire. We have uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, Omicron spreading like wildfire. Uh, we know vaccines save lives. We know that where people is vaccinated, uh, even if they get the disease, the disease is much more mild, uh, with less impacts on hospital systems, with less people dying. And so vaccines save lives. Let's make sure that vaccines spread like wildfire as the Omicron is spreading like wildfire. Secretary General, has the pandemic scarred us so badly that the world will never be the same again? Of course, the world will never be the same again. And I'm particularly worried with the fact that the recovery from the pandemic is very uneven. Uh, we have seen uh, trillions of dollars being used by developed countries to boost their economies uh, to recover quickly from the pandemic. Unfortunately, developing countries, most of them have not that possibility. Uh, they are uh, uh, having dramatic problems with debt. Uh, they uh, have no fiscal space. Uh, uh, there has been very, uh, uh, they have no capacity to uh, uh, print money like uh, the US or like the European Union can through the activities of their central banks. Uh, that they cannot do the same. Uh, and so uh, this desperate situation in which are witnessing uh, uh, is the one in which uh, African countries and uh, other developing countries are now recovering much more slowly and in a much more unfair way than the developed countries. So the distance that should be decreasing is increasing. And the capacity for developing countries to implement the sustainable development goals, to guarantee education, health to their populations, to serve their people, this capacity is being undermined. Uh, they have to serve this, their debts and are not able because of that to serve their people. That's why we have been claiming the, for the need of deep reforms in the international financial system that uh, is in a situation that I would consider morally bankrupted. Secretary General, the picture you paint is incredibly bleak. What is the one thing you think that the United Nations must achieve this year? Well, the United Nations is totally committed for vaccine equity, we need, as I mentioned, to vaccinate everybody everywhere. This is our fundamental priority. Second, we need to uh, introduce uh, or to help to introduce or to push for a number of uh, systemic changes in our international financial architecture, uh, international financial system, in order uh, to have a fair recovery, not only for developed countries, but also for developing ones. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, what was not reached in, in Glasgow, which was the guarantee that there would be a reduction of uh, uh, a dramatic reduction of emissions in the next decade to allow for 
the possibility of the temperature in the world not to go out above 1.5 degrees, uh, we need to make a huge effort, especially to support those emerging economies that are still dependent on coal uh, uh, to be able to accelerate their transition with uh, very strong support from the developed countries, with coalitions of developed countries, with the international financial institutions, with private finance, and with, of course, companies that have the technology to support them, to make sure that uh, um, countries that have been expressing their will uh, to do more, like India, like Indonesia, like uh, um, South Africa, like uh, um, um, Vietnam, that uh, still have a very important share of the, their um, uh, energy mix uh, based on coal, are supported to be able to accelerate that transition. Secretary General, thank you very much for being in conversation. I hope next year, though, that when we talk again, it will be a more optimistic year. Do you think so? Let's hope so. And uh, uh, I usually say that, uh, to, as Jean Monnet has said one time, uh, I'm not optimistic, I'm not pessimistic, I'm determined. I'm determined to do everything I can. In the humble uh, position and capacities that I have, to do everything I can uh, for the better world uh, we all want. We hope very much so as well, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.